Good morning, children. How are you doing? I hope you had a good night. Well, we're back in Sunday school today. Last Sunday, Auntie Bella told you you were having the last lesson for the year. And now we're going to have a quiz. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are good. Thank you, Lord, for taking us through the year 2020. Thank you, Father Lord, for taking us through the central theme, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. Father, we're so grateful. Father Lord, we pray that everything we have learned will be ingrained in us, Lord. We want to learn of you. We want to be doers of that which you have taught us. Walk in us, Holy Spirit, and help us become changed people. Even to the glory of your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. So children, yes, we're having the last quarter quiz, quiz on consequences of lack of self-control. But beyond the quiz, please, children, the most important thing is to let these things flow in your lives. You could have 100% your quiz, but if you're not leaving this out, it wouldn't have been worth it. So I want to believe that you want to be changed. And if you agree with the Holy Spirit, you'll do a marvelous work in your life. For me, I find this quite emotional because for nine good years, we've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And this is the ninth year, so we're rounding up, or we've rounded up on our teaching on the fruit of the Spirit. So come next year, we're going on to a completely different central theme. So through this year, we've had four sub-themes. We've done, we've had self-control in waiting, we've had self-control in action, we've had self-control in relationships, and the last we have had has been the consequences of lack of self-control. Under this, we've looked at characters, really because it's when we look at the lives of people that we're able to see where they've gotten it right or they've not gotten it right. And that's why we chose to do characters. The first character we studied was Moses, and that was in the book, um, in Numbers chapter 20, from verses 1 to 12. And our memory verse for that was 1 Corinthians 9:27. 1 Corinthians 9:27. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should not be disqualified. So you see, it's talking about discipline, helping us to become self -trained. And we will see through the story of Moses how he lacked self-control and what the consequence was. He says that the children of Israel were in the wilderness on their way, obviously, from um, Egypt, going on to the promised land, that's Canaan. And Moses, uh, Miriam, Moses' sister, had died. And there, there was no water, and so the children of Israel grumbled and mumbled and all that. And God, you know, Moses was very upset. Moses and Aaron fell before the Lord in intercession for the people. And God, being so kind and loving, asked Moses to speak to the Lord. But Moses was so upset. And in that anger, instead of he, God asked him to gather the children of Israel because God wanted to do something before them so that they could see how powerful he is. And so Moses and Aaron gathered them and he of Moses to just speak to the rock. What did he do? He hit the rock twice. We've done all this. So this is a revision. And yes, he hit it and water did flow. Yes, they got the water. But God was not happy at all with Moses. And let's see, God said to Moses that he did not believe him. God called it what? A lack of belief in him. That if Moses had believed him, he would have done exactly what he said. And he said because of that, he was not glorified in the eyes of the children of Israel. And what did God say? He says because he had done this, because he had not brought glory to him, Moses' Moses's assignment was to take the children of Israel from Egypt onto the Canaan land. Moses missed his destiny. His life assignment was to get the children of 
Israel into the land of Canaan. And God said he was not going to be able to do that. So that is a result or a consequence of not exhibiting self-control. After that, we talked about Samson. For Samson, we looked at the book of Judges, chapter 13, verses 1 to 5, then chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, then chapter 16, verses 4 to 21. And our memory verse for Samson was Proverbs 25, 28. We're going to see this particular memory verse, our uh, resolve, sorry, because I'm talking, this is revision. We saw this particular memory verse come up about three times in this um, fourth quarter sub thing. And it says, a person without self-control is like a city without, with broken down walls. A person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. So may God help us that we would have self-control. So it will not be like a city that its walls are broken. So what was it about Samson? We're going to remind ourselves. Samson was, Samson's birth was very unique. God sent an angel to speak to his mom. And um, his father was Manoah. And he came from, he lived in the town of Zoar, uh, from the tribe of Dan. And um, they had no children. And God sent an angel to speak to his mother. And she told, he told her five things. He said she would conceive and bear a son. He said she was not to drink any wine or anything similar, any strong drink. She was told, she was told that um, she was not to eat any unclean thing and um, Samson was not to eat any unclean thing. Samson, no razor was to touch his head. And, um, and that made, that meant that he was going to be a Nazarite, okay? And then that he would begin the deliverance of Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. So his life had five purposes. That is one of those, I mean, that's one thing that was unique about Samson. So come, Samson was born, he grew up, God had a law, the children of Israel were not to marry people who did not believe in God, call them unbelievers, call them the Philistines. But then we see Samson get up and he went to Timnah. Timnah was the town of the Philistines. And then he saw a girl and he told his parents that that was a girl he was going to marry. And his parents tried to convince him, but Samson was not going to hear anything of that. He said that was the person he wanted and that his parents were to get him this girl. So we find that here he broke a law that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 3 that they were not to marry from the heathen countries. Then again, we go on to the last, second, next phase. Samson went down again to another town of the Philistines, and here he met another lady called Delilah. So through all this, we see a, a, a particular weakness running in the life of Samson. He had a weakness for women. And I suppose Philistines would Philistine women for that matter, because if it was the Israelite women, so maybe he would have married one of them and that would have um, met God's um, uh, requirements. But then again, he went to the in Sorek, and there was this woman called Delilah, and uh, he fell in love with her. And, but Delilah was not as faithful to him as he would have expected, one would have expected. The um, our Philistine lords saw this and they went to her and they got into a deal with her that they wanted to know what was behind Samson's strength because they had seen Samson deal with them in so many ways and they wanted to know what it was and Delilah was going to help them. That showed unfaithfulness. And so she kept asking Samson for the secret of his um, energy or power, whatever you want to call it. First he said if he was tied with raw new um, ropes, that if they bound him with seven streets that had not been, not dry, that he would become weak. She did that, she called the Philistines, and when they came, she cried unto him, Samson, the Philistines are here. And what happened? He broke that whole thing, which meant that that was not the secret. 
Then she needled him and needled him again. I said, oh, Samson, you've not told me the truth. And what did he say? He said, if you bind me with a new rope that has never been used, I'll become weak. She went, she got it again, called the Philistines, and when she shouted again at him, Samson, the Philistines are here, what happened? He broke it again. And that chill. So she just kept niggling him. And this happened three times. And so the, um, the third time, he talked about what? Sewing seven of his locks into the weave. And she did, sewed it down, and the Philistines came, came again, and what happened? He just yanked his head off the thing, and, and she's now said, no, you can't love me if you keep telling me lies. You can't love me, it's not possible. And Samson decided to tell her the truth. And while Samson was sleeping, what happened? She made him sleep on her laps. She got a razor blade, and did what? He scraped off his head. And Samson, because he was so careless, he thought, oh, as usual, when she screamed again, he would get up. And what happened? She screamed, oh, Samson, the Philistines are here. And this time, the Lord left him. This is somebody who was a Nazarite. A Nazarite is somebody who is separated unto the Lord. And we find the Lord departing from him because of lack of self-control. So yes, the power went and the Philistines came, arrested him, handcuffed him, gouged out his eyes, and made him a prisoner, um, a grinder in the prison. So we see, yes, he died and all that, but yes, he killed more people at the end of his life than he ever did, but the main thing was that he did not fulfill his destiny. When we lack self-control, we get derailed along the line. The third person we talked about was Saul. And this was from 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, 14. And again, the memory verse, the Proverbs 25, 28, that we have talked about, came up here again. It says, like a city whose walls are broken down, is a man who lacks self-control. So Saul had been made the first king Israel ever had, like we heard in the scripture, the tallest man, very good looking and all that. And after he had reigned for two years, he gathered 2,000 soldiers around him. I mean, 3,000 soldiers, 2,000 were with him, 1,000 with his son, Jonathan. And the Philistines began to gather. And they saw a large crowd and everybody became afraid. And you found that the men with Saul began to hide. We heard that some of them even crossed the Jordan to guard and places like that. Some began to hide in, in um, caves. And Samson, someone had told him he was coming to offer God's offering unto the Lord, to ask the Lord what they were to do. Someone had told him he was coming in seven days. And seven days went by and someone didn't come. And by this time he was getting fr frantic. People were running away, he was afraid, he was wondering what to do. But you know what? He disobeyed God. As king, he, he knew the law. Nobody except a priest was to offer bond sacrifice. And in his fear, he went to offer bond sacrifice. Just as he was finishing, Samuel came. And of course, I believe the Lord must have told Samuel. And Samuel said to him, what have you done? And of course, he gave the excuses. You see, these people had gathered, people were running away, and I couldn't go to the war without talking to the Lord. So I decided and said, you have done foolishly. So children, when we disobey, when we lack self-control, God says what? We have done foolishly. And what happened? He said, the dynasty was going to terminate with him. The kingship was not going to go down his descendants. It was being taken away from him. And God said that what? He had found himself another person who was after his heart. So again, you see, lack of self, the consequence of lack of self-control being that what? He lost his destiny. He lost that which was to be his portion. He lost what was going to be a heritage for his children and grandchildren. So may God help us to keep away and learn to be self-controlled. The fourth person we talked about was David. His story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 5, and um, chapter 12, verses 7 to 12. And the memory verse here is different. It's Romans 6, 12. 
Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. This is very apt for David, because he obeyed the evil desires of his flesh. So may we not, he says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That was what happened to David. David was king, his people were, the city was, the, the country was at war, and instead of David going to war with his men, what happened? He stayed at home and sent Joab his um, commander. So Joab went to war and he stayed at home. That was the first one. The second one was one of those days he decided to stroll on the, the rooftop. And while strolling, he saw a beautiful woman having a bath. He didn't just look and take his eyes away. He wanted to know who she was. And when they told him, oh, that's Uriah's wife, that should have told him that that was a no-go area. But it didn't stop David. His flesh had gotten the better of him. He still stayed sent for her and slept with her. And he thought, you know, as she went away, he thought the matter was over. But you see, God has a way of catching up with us. The next thing, she could, but the name of this lady, of course, is Bathsheba, like we know. And um, she sent a message to him that she was pregnant. And David tried to um, cover it up by getting her husband to come in and all that. And um, he didn't, um, he came in but wouldn't go to his wife. And when he tried and tried in that direction and it wasn't working, he decided to send him back to the battlefield and got Joab and go to withdraw. And the, um, the Philistines shot him and threw well, some uh, stone on him and he died. And God was not happy about this at all. God was not happy. Because God sent Nathan, a prophet, to him and uh, told him a story. And he was so angry. Who could have done that? Who could have done such a terrible thing? And Nathan said, it's you. And well, thank God enough, he immediately you know, felt very apologetic and said he had sinned and asked God for forgiveness. But God was angry. God said a few things to him. He said, you killed Uriah with the sword of the people of Ammon. Therefore, so the sword will never depart from your family. These are the consequences. The second thing God said was that he would raise adversity against him from his own family. He was going to raise adversity against David from his own family. Then the third thing was that he slept with Bathsheba in secret. God said that he was going to get people to sleep with his wife in public. There are then consequences for, him, for losing our control. May God help us that we don't lose self-control. Because God had done so many things for us. Um, David, like God reminded him through Nathan, he said, I delivered you from the hand of Saul. Remember, Saul was chasing after David and wanted to kill him, and God delivered him from it. God reminded him at that point. God said, I gave you all that belonged to Saul, and I gave you his wife. If that was not enough, if you, I would have given you more. And God reminded him of another thing. He said, I gave you the houses of Israel and Judah. If you remember, David was first made king somewhere in Judah before the whole of Israel came together. So he was made king twice. So this, God reminded him of all this. So God was not happy. Let us not make God unhappy with us because of lack of self control. So the fifth person we talked about was Ammon. Ammon, the story of Ammon is found in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 to 15 and then from verses 23 to 29. And the Proverbs um, memory verse is up here again. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a person who lacks self-control. So this is the third time. So children, I believe this is one memory verse you've got to know. We've had it, we had it three times through the last quarter. And what Ammon was the son of David, you know? God had told David that he was going to raise adversity against him from his family. And he said the sword would not depart from his family. We begin to see the consequences of what their father did. But even then, the children themselves exhibited lack of self-control. Ammon suddenly decides that the person he wanted was his half-sister, Tamar. And he, was, he wanted her so much that he was so distressed and all that. 
And then he had a cousin and a friend who was not a good friend. Children, may we always choose, ask God to give us friends so that we have good friends that will lead us in the right path. David had a friend, Jonadab, his cousin, who was not good. Because Jonadab came and saw him feeling so distressed. He said, now where is the king's son looking so distressed and harassed? He said, because I love my sister Tamar and it's distressing. He said, ah, you, you're the son of the king. You can get anything you want. That's not true. You don't ask or look for the wrong things. He said, lie down, pretend as if you're sick. Your father will come to see you. And when your father comes to see you, tell him that you want Tama to come and cook for you. And I'm, I'm not decided to do this. I'm not laid down sick, and as usual, the doting father David came to see his son. And he said, oh, dad, oh, please, if you could send Tama to come and cook for me. And my father didn't question that. He sent Tama. Tama came cooked. She brought the food, he refused to eat. And he said, send, her, send everybody away. And she sent everybody away and said, bring it to my bed. And she did. And what happened? He overpowered her. And she begged him. She said, please don't do this. You can ask, you know, then in the, in, amongst the um, Israelis, they could marry, intermarry. They could marry their half-sisters and their cousins and all that. He said, ask father, he'll allow me marry you. But let's do it the proper way. But he wasn't. You know, when you're desperate for something, you don't want to even follow protocols. You just do things anyhow. And that's a sign of lack of self-control. And he wasn't. He just forced himself on it. But you see, the devil makes something look so important, so valuable to you for one minute. And after you had it, you just lose interest. And what happened? The Bible says he hated her with as much hate as he loved her. And what happened? As soon as he had done that, he told her to get out of her room. And she begged and pleaded and said, don't do this, please don't do this. This would even be worse than what you've already done. But he wasn't ready to listen. Self -control, lack of self-control makes us lose our reasoning. It makes us lose sense, um, any form of reasoning at all. And he wasn't ready to listen. And he said, take her out, take her out. And he threw her out. And the poor girl left that room crying. She tore her priestly dress and all that and went to her brother's house. But you see what? When things, happen, when things happen, when something evil happens, be ready to talk about it. The brother Absalom was not ready to talk about it. He said, don't talk, don't make noise, don't worry, stay in my house, I'll look after you. He was angry, he didn't address his anger. The father David heard about it and didn't even do anything about it. And it, you know, when you try to cover sin, it doesn't solve it. It just makes it worse. So they left it like that and he kept going. Anyway, for Amnon, what happened? Two years later, Absalom is a terrible, Absalom is a terrible person. He knows how to bear grudges. He kept it and he kept planning. And he kept planning for two full years. Then he decided to do ship sharing. And he decided to invite his brothers. The brothers came. They were, he wanted even their father to come. Their father said he wasn't going to go, but the brothers went. And he told his servants, when Amnon is merry at heart, kill him. And they'll be like, how, how can we do that? He said, I have given you the command. When he's merry at heart and can't, has, you know, when you're a bit tipsy, you lose a bit of your senses and you're weak. He said, at that point, do what? Kill him. And of course, when he got merry, what happened? Amnon, um, the, uh, so Absalom's um, servants killed him. And all the other king's sons got onto their horses and fled. And what had been said happened. Amnon lost his life because of lack of self-control. These are some of the consequences of lack of self-control. May God deliver us from all these things in Jesus' name. And then we go on to our last, our next person who is Absalom himself. Absalom had killed his brother, Amnon, but that hadn't kind of assuaged his anger. He, he ran, of course, he'd done something terrible, he ran away from home, he didn't see his father, his father didn't send for him. Again, they left things, they didn't address issues, and this thing continued to, um, to brew. And after four years, he started coming around. And he go close to his father's court 
and see the people who've come to see his father. And he tells them, you know, if I had, if I was a judge, I would give you justice at a faster rate. They come to bow before him. He says, oh, no, 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 don't bow. And he kiss them. You know, he showed them as if he loved them. Sometimes people who tend to show that kind of love could be pretending, just like that certain was. So we need to ask God to help us be discerning and to know those who truly loved us. But he was just doing this because he had a plan he was hatching behind. And he kept doing this. And when he had done this for quite a while, and the people of course must have said, talking, oh, Absalom is such a lovely person. He's so gentle. He's so loving. He did this until he said what? He said he won the heart of the people. And I did tell you where to find this. This is found in 2 Samuel 15, 1 to 16, and 18, 9 to 5. And, uh, 9 to 15, and we have the same memory verse again. Proverbs 25, verse 28. So we see it's very recurring. Okay? So then, Absalom, when he found he had really won the hearts of the people, he told his father, oh, that he needed permission to go to Hebron. That when he was living in Hebron, he had made a vow to the Lord, and he wanted to go and fulfill it. His father didn't know what he was planning. He went off. When he was going, he went with about 200 men with him. And then he let spies go through Israel, telling them that um, when they heard a trumpet, they should all shout what? Absalom reigns in Hebron. And even when he was in Hebron, he kept inviting people from Jerusalem. So people were gradually moving from Jerusalem to Hebron. A number of them moving innocently, not understanding what was happening, not really understanding that they were part of the plot of what was going on. But thank God, David had some messengers, some people working with him who were quite discerning. One of them noticed what was happening. And when I told David, the heart, Absalom has won the heart of the people and he's in Hebron with them. And David being a very, you know, he was a great man of war, so he understood what was happening. And he said, we need to leave now. If we don't leave, Absalom will catch up with us and it will be horrible. So he left. His um, throne, he left the palace, he left the town with a number of his whole household. He left some concubines and some wives to um, guard, look after the house where he left. He says he left 10 women and concubines to keep house while he left. And just as he got out of the city, he checked to see the people who were with him and he sent one or two back to be in the um, in town, so that they would check what was happening. Anyway, when Absalom knew that his father had left, he now marched over to war. And Joab, who was with David, went to war against them. Of course, David couldn't stand going to war against the son, so he didn't go. And of course, I'm sure he must have been advised not to go. So Joab and his men went to war. And while they were pursuing Absalom's men, Absalom was a very good looking guy with a lot of hair, very long hair. And we're told that he was riding on his moon under a Tiberian tree. And his hair, his long hair, got caught in the tree. And the moon he was riding on did what? Moved on. And Absalom was left hanging on the tree. One of um, Joab's men saw him and told Joab, Oh, I saw what happened. Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He's there, his moon has. And did you kill him? And Abba said, oh no, he's a king's son. I can't kill him. No matter how much money you give me, I don't do such a thing. I can't do it. I can't kill the king's son. And what did Joab do? Joab threw three spares into the heart of Absalom and got him down and got his men to do what? To finally kill him. Again, Absalom was patient. He was rebellious. He wasn't going to wait for his son to take over the kingship. So we find that lack of self-control is a very dangerous thing. What happened to him? He died in the process. May God help us to learn to be self-controlled. We have gone through these teachings for a whole quarter, and it should not be in vain. Our last character or character study is Gehazi. And this is found in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 to 27. And our memory verse is Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no. It teaches, it teaches us to do what? To say no 
to ungodliness and worldly passions. So when ungodliness and worldly passions come calling, the Spirit of God teaches us to do what? Say no. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. May God help us. So this is the story of Naaman, who was a commander in the Syrian army. He was a good, he says he was a man of, an honorable man and a man of valor. But he had one big problem. And what was that? Children who studied it, you know what it was? Yes, it was. And you know, and whatever it is, it kind of gives you a, a, a bit of a concern when you have these things. But in Naaman's house was this little girl. She was a captive from Israel who was waiting on Naaman's wife. She was a girl who knew her God, who knew what God can do. And she said to her mistress, you know, if my master would go to the prophet in Israel, I'm sure he would be healed of this leprosy. And the wife who loved her husband and was concerned told her husband, see, this girl in her house said if you could go to the prophet, that you could be healed. And the man of God, the, um, the warrior, said, ah. So he went to his king, the king of Syria, and said, this is what the girl in my house said. Well, they didn't understand the ways of God. You see, the men of the world don't really understand the ways of God, so they go about it their own way. And so the king of Syria wrote a letter to the king of Egypt, um, Israel, and said, heal my servant, Naaman. And so Naaman prepared and went with a lot of goodies we're told he went with 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothes. These were things he was going to give to whoever was going to heal him of this leprosy. So he gets to Israel, and he gives the king of Israel the letter. And the king of Israel was like, am I God to heal? I'm not God, I can't heal anybody. And he was so upset, he thought they were looking for an opportunity to war with him. And he tore his garment. But you see, he had a man of God in his country, Elisha. And when Elisha heard, he said, what? Why would this king of Israel tear his clothes because of this? Send the man to me. So they sent Naaman to him. And Naaman got to his house. Naaman expected, because he was a big man, you know, big men have a way, the way they think. He expected Elisha to come out and address him personally, and Elisha didn't come out. Elisha said, what? Tell him to go to the river Jordan and wash himself seven times. And he was upset. I'm a big man, you have scorned him. He said, what? He didn't even come out to see me. He didn't even come out to look at me, you know? And he's asking me to go and wash in the river Jordan. Are the rivers in our place, River, river Papa and River Abana, Abama, not seven times better than this river? Why should I go to? But thank God, you see, Naaman seemed to have very good people around him. First, he had that slave girl, then he had his own servants. And they said, Master, ah, if this man had asked you to do something big, would you have done it? All he's asked you to do is go and wash in the water. Please, sir, could you just try it? You know, we can make a difference where we are. These servants did make a difference. And thank God, Naaman listened to them and he went and he washed. Wow! We're told that his skin became what? Like the skin of a baby. And he was so excited. He ran back to Elisha's house. This time, no more angry, but very excited. Ready to give him something in exchange for what he had done for him. And Elisha said, no, he wasn't going to take any of that. So Naaman was pretty good. And you know, yes, I said, brother taught us this last week. And you remember what name she called Gehazi? She called him what? Greedy. He has to was like, you mean this man is going to go away with all these goodies he brought? Ah, no, I'm not going to let him. No, 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 no. I'm just going to go behind my master's back and go and collect. My master doesn't need to know what I've done. And true, he went, thinking he had, um, Elisha would know. And he stopped him and said, oh, sir. He, um, Naaman saw him coming and go down from his horse. I said, is there anything the matter? He said, yes, you know, we have some sons of prophets who have just come, and my master, and oh, Neba was so excited, he was ready to give anything. So he gave him clothes and all that, and said, oh, go give your master. And Gehazi quickly hid these things, thinking, oh, his master will be known. But you see, the Holy Spirit knows all things. There's nothing, you know, when we do this, I think last week, yes, we've sang it, 
You cannot hide anything from God. You can't hide anything from God. If you remember in Psalm 139, it says, wherever, whatever, God sees, God knows all things. So when he came in, Elisha said to him, so where have you been? I said, no, I've not been anywhere. He said, don't you know that I saw you when you were this? And what happened? Elisha said to him, Black person that was on him would come on And not just upon him, he said, and his descendants. So that one minute of greed and lack of self-control, what did he, what was the consequence? Having leprosy, not just for him, but also for his generations yet. You know, so looking through all these seven lessons, we find that the consequences of lack of self-control are very refuse. So as we end the year, children, let's talk to ourselves. And let's say to ourselves, I will discipline my body. I will call on to the Lord. As the Holy Spirit opens my eyes to show me my weaknesses, I will call on to the Lord to work on them for me. Because the Bible says what? Walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. That the Lord will remove so that these consequences will not follow us. So, yes, children, I've gone through the seven lessons. We've gone through the memory verses. So I want to believe that you're prepared for your peace. I believe we'll do very well. Because even last Sunday, I did give you, I did go through some of this in class. So children, do your best. But like I said, it's more important to even be doers. Yes, I expect you to do very well in your peace. But the most important thing, children, is that you begin to practice these things that we have done. So let us pray. It's going to be Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for teaching us about self-control. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us over and over again what it means to be self-controlled. Thank you, Lord, for these seven people we have studied and has shown us what the lack of self-control could bring into our lives. Father, in any area in our lives where we lack self-control, we ask, Lord, that you will walk on us. Help us to put our bodies on you. Help us to discipline our bodies. Help us to call upon you. Help us to be obedient. Remove every spirit of rebellion and whatever from us and let our lives bring glory to you. This is our prayer, Lord. And thank you for Holy Spirit for reminding these children of all that we have taught them in this last quarter, that they may excel to pray and bring glory to your name in Jesus' name. Amen. The grace, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, children. And God bless you. Have a happy, happy, happy Christmas. This brings to an end all the teachings and all the pieces for 2020. Have a wonderful new year. Amen.